How you doing, Vaughn Gaddings? Um, the book we're reviewing today is called Black Male in a White Coat. Here's the um, here's the um, cover of it. The author's name is Damon Tweedy. This is my sixth book review, and uh, we're doing something a little different today. We're doing a few chapters of Black Male in a White Coat and a summary of the things I've read about it. So let's get started. So a little bit about the Arthur. Here's the Arthur right here. His name is Damon Tweedy. He's um, um, a, a assistant professor at Duke University. And uh, he he has a very interesting story. He was a, a former Division One basketball player. He went to Mexico. I think he went to University of Maryland. He went to one of the University of Maryland schools, not the University of Maryland. So. He's coming from this suburban experience. He's coming from a school, a lesser named school. And he's studying at Duke University for um, med school in this book. And he's talking about all these challenges and all these things he sees. And it's so interesting, so fascinating. And it's tragic in a way, talking about the outcry of public health in inner city communities among black people. So very fascinating book. I really recommend you all to read it. And hopefully what I share with you makes you want to read the book a little bit, a little bit more. So um, Damon talks about this concept of being an academic casualty. And what he means by that is, you know, um, at times he, ha he goes through um, what we call imposter syndrome where you know you don't feel like you belong somewhere even though you do everything to get there you don't feel like you belong so he talks about how on his first day of medical school this um doctor professor stops him and says um why isn't my lights fixed he kind of grills him and looks up to the sky and says my lights isn't fixed and i called you a week ago to fix them and Damon, who's just like a medical student, like everyone in his class says, um, I'm not a maintenance man. I'm a med student. And, you know, this kind of stuck with Damon throughout the first few chapters. And he had to prove himself because he had insecurities of not feeling like he belonged in a medical school space after then. So he had that was motivation for him to be a better be the best he can possibly be but you know we that happens to us a lot we're in spaces where you know it's not a lot of black um, um blacks a lot of not a lot of allies not a lot of people who you know will help you or are supportive of you in that journey despite what despite their race ethnicity or gender you know it gets like that and damon he observed so many um blacks who had to repeat medical school because they were underprepared because their school didn't have the resources that Ivy League school has or an, um, you know or or an, uh, private school has or some other international school has so that's that's just something he dealt with at the beginning of his med school journey so then um, I want to talk about the chapter about black women's health because that really meant a lot so there was a young lady named Leslie who comes in, um, comes in a facility, comes in the ER, and um, Leslie's 19 years old, looks like she was just tired, raggedy clothes, thin hair was falling out. And he asked Leslie, um, you know, are you pregnant? Um, she said, I don't know. Um, and comes to find out she is pregnant. She's bleeding in her like in her um, private areas, and they don't know where to bleed, how to bleed it starts. Um, they don't know where it comes from. It's just a really tragic situation. So, as a doctor, Dana asks, "Hey, have you done any drugs? Have you drank the last 24 to 48 hours?" And the young lady says, "No, I've done none of that. Everything you're saying, I'm saying no to." But a more senior doctor, older white lady, comes in and just straight straight up asks the young lady, um, have you done crack cocaine? 
And the young lady breaks down, starts crying, and said, yes, I have. I've done it two days ago. And come to find out the baby um, that was delivered, um, she dies. Um, and this girl's just breaking down in the hospital crying. And this other doctor proposes to the senior doctor, the doctor that was Carla, a younger lady. She says, maybe this young, young lady does not need to have kids anymore. We should recommend her to get her tubes tied and she shouldn't have kids because she delivered a dead baby. And the first thing Damon thinks about is this idea of sterilization that has happened among black women. So like in California around 1997, it's, yeah, 1997, Damon said that a lot of black women were paid to be sterilized because they felt like they were delivering these quote unquote crack babies, you know, I, you know, they didn't have the money, so they took the money and it's pretty much an act of exploitation. And then, you know, there were other cases like in North Carolina, South Carolina, where women were forced to, um, to take sterilization shots where they won't have kids anymore, or, um, they were locked up and sterilized in certain states because just because they, were using drugs while they're having kids. Now, it's not right to use drugs while you're pregnant, but you don't need to have a death sentence. You don't know why these women were using drugs. You don't know what they were going through. And the first thing you do is punish them or even have an ideal of punishing them because forever or for whatever reason for this um, extended period of time because they made a wrong turn. So it just made me think of like what black women have had to go through as far as, um, you know, with their bodies. And, you know, he talked about all these other health problems that just pop up out of nowhere that us men are already privy about. So, and, and, and we know what was the reasons why these things happen, especially among young, young women. Um, you know, lack of um, two parent households, you know, that caused maybe like teenage pregnancy or no oversight, um, lack of jobs, lack of access to real skills to get a good paying job with health insurance. Um, you know, the man, the guy just like walks out on them and leaves them alone. So we don't know what type of uh, impact that has on them mentally, but it, it was way too much and it was way too tragic. So let's just move on to, um, the conversation um, he had about charity care. And with charity care, um, he talked about how Medicare was just not enough. And, um, you know, how many people were not on um, health care, did not have any health insurance, 25 million to be exact, um, right now in America, around 25 to 27 million. And um, 26,000 die each year um, because if they don't have health care and healthcare is too cost, uh, costly. So um, so he talks about these hospitals that they'll take Medicare, but they have low quality health insurance and, it, and it's pretty much given to black people or poor people, people who are not making a lot of money. So um, he also talked about hypertension and um, he had an experience of um, hypertension even within himself that he found his blood pressure was higher than normal. But uh, fifty percent of of blacks um, have uh, have um, um, hypertension. Well, it's fifty percent more common in blacks versus whites, and it's more aggressive in blacks, and it leads to um, things like um, strokes, kidney failures, heart attacks, um, diabetes, all these different things that he was talking about in his book. It's just so sad. Some of the cases of the people who, who entered the hospital, some of them died just because you know, their blood pressure was just through the roof or their diet or they had diabetes or kidney failure. And um, Dr. Woody said that the re his research when he read in medical school, it came from um, this, this um, these hypertension cases come from you know, American racism. It started with, um, slavery 
and um, the things that American slaves had to endure, and it was passed down to their children who were victims of the Reconstruction era, and then of the Jim Crow era, and then of um, of the Jim Crow era, and um, and then you have mass incarceration, the war on drugs. So when when you have all these public health crises, lack of jobs. Uh, higher end discriminations, um, um, all these different things that happen in our communities, uh, police violence, it, it causes stress. And stress raises um, your blood pressure. And then 75% of Blacks have hypertension before the age of 55. So we need to monitor, we need to monitor our blood pressure, man. But it's so hard to because of the things that happen in our communities. It's just fascinating to read about that. And then he talked about black men and their and their issues with um with um um health and medicine. So he said he was at this hospital called Grady Hospital. It's really, really uh, public hospital in Atlanta, low quality health care. Um, a lot of med students who are just practicing on students, unfortunately. So um, what is Grady Hospital? Um, that's what that was. Um, OK, so his first case while he was in Grady Hospital, he saw a black male um, he saw a black male um, suffer a gunshot wound. Um, that was the first thing he saw when he was there. And, you know, it made me think about when you're in the streets, you know, when you're out, if you, um, you know, and no judgment to anybody, if you're out selling drugs, if you're, if you're gang banging, whatever you're doing, that that's a public health, that could be a public health risk, man. You getting shot, you know, you risking your family you getting hurt, you know, loss of sleep. If you're out selling drugs, if you're out, you know, doing what you got to do, or um, you're out at night um, handling business, um, the stress levels you take from opposing from opposing gang members, oppositions, that that's a public health issue, man. And you know, all those things can lead to you going in the hospital. You know, you um, called paying paying for. Something you don't have to pay for. If you get shot, imagine how much that is to get the bullet taken out of you if you survive. You know, imagine what the stress levels of, you know, of somebody coming to kill you or try to take you out does for your mental health. So, man, being in the streets is a public health crisis, man. We need to start, like, putting it like that. And I understand um, what these young men have to go through, but we got to put it out there. And maybe it'll cause them to make different decisions. But again, all those things are a uh, uh, um, microcosm of, of American American racism and uh, structural racism. And then we talked about um, just mental health. I mean, he talked about, now we talked about mental health. A lot of black men coming in the hospital, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, um, you know, and these black men, you no, know, they didn't go to therapy. They just use alcohol to drink their pain away or to smoke or sniff their pain away. And, you know, a, a lot of these things will change if you just, you know, get help. But then the downside is a lot of them don't have health insurance. A lot of them don't have jobs. So what do you do with these people? They're just casualties, walking, walking casualties, man. And then, of course, black men, we got to be better with domestic violence. He said he saw a case where there was um like these two guys fighting over this woman who was strung out on drugs. She stabbed one of the guys with a crack cocaine needle and he was in the hospital. They had to make sure he was OK, but he hit the woman. He beat on the woman and all this stuff, this hyper masculinity, this tension is it's a public health issue. So in closing. I'm talking to black men, black women, wherever you identify as, um, you know, systematic racism is a public health crisis and almost everything we do ties back to help, you know, everything we go through, but let's be victors instead of victims by um, um, going to the doctor, using resources, um, taking care of one another and um, watching our biases, 
you know, instead of um, and not judging each other. So this is me, Javon Gathings. I'm out. Thank you.